Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this second panel session here at ICEA ICEA 2022. Uh, we are presenting Island of the Day Before, Authentic Artistic Exploration in Post-Anthropocenic Food Ecologies. I'm crying. I, it's too loud. Maybe. No. No, the lights are okay. bright. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, the light. <laughs> okay. So, uh, with... We are with Julian Staden, Eric Zepka, Marta de Menezes, Maya Minder, Roland Van, sorry, Van Dierendrock, yeah, Marapevo. Sorry, okay. So I leave you with this wonderful panelist with this fantastic topic and see you in an hour. <laughs> no, it's a joke. I'm still here. Okay, so thank, thank you, Susanna. Hello, everyone. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'll, I'll just get started with a bit of a synopsis of what we're going to talk about. So this panel will explore historical and contemporary engagements of art that address our relationship with food and the systems that relate to these. In a wide sprawling discourse that intersects augmentation and ecological aesthetics with art and science practice, this panel will present a discussion around the plethora of artists' work that creates cross bindings and transdisciplinary approaches between the different topics of post-agriculture, post-growth, and molecular cooking, specifically. Um, the discussion aims to create new thoughts on food systems through artistic research that addresses topics of scale and scope in the post-Anthropocenic era with micro to macro subconnectivities in ecological systems, post-nature ideologies, microbio and fungal remedies, and molecular transitions in human and non-human bodily encounters. Boom. Okay, so... I'm just going to introduce this wonderful panel, speaking with my, starting with my wonderful self. Um, I'm Julian Staden, and I'm an artist, designer, curator, researcher, and educator. Um, my practice-based research interfaces art via digital entanglements, identity, embodied interactive, fitty, food ecology, sustainability, culture, and society. I'm currently finished my PhD on uh, post-biological identity and augmentation aesthetics. Uh, which is focused primarily on the establishment of the mixed and augmented reality art organization, which I present on Wednesday, and my data body trader project. Sitting next to me is Maro Pibo, who is an artist trained as an art historian and fascinated by biological matter. Born in Mexico City, she holds a PhD, has a PhD in creative media from City University of Hong Kong, and an MA in critical and gender studies from Bologna University. We, it, it didn't say it when it, anyway. Um, it just said PhD. Uh, anyway, um, weaving collaborations, Maro uh, works on defying anthropocentrism and on skeptical environmental accountability. Her transdisciplinary work complements and transforms the responsibility of the life science to think about biological matter. Um, Maya. Sorry. Maya, Cooking Us Transforms Us is a framework that Maya Minda waves, weaves excuse me, like a string through her work. Cooking serves her to reveal the metaphor of the human transformation of raw nature into cooked culture, and she combines it to the evolutionary ideas of symbiotic coexistence between plants, animals, and humans. She creates entanglements between human commodities and animism of nature. A table of diversity not yet discussed. Following the biohacker maker and third space movement, she uses grassroots ideas, safe zones and citizen science in her field to enable collective storytelling through food and cooking. Uh, Mai is also a, an artist at Hacteria and a journalist at The Makery. Uh, Zepka. So you probably already, already know Eric. He's probably talked to you by now. Um, Eric is a scientific and cultural researcher specializing in laboratory biology, computer code, open access, and creative applications. He's currently engaged in research at the University of Barcelona, at COVID research, excuse me, at the University of Barcelona. He's presented his work globally as a scientist, a theorist, an artist, an interdisciplinary researcher, and he's also the founding president of the Open Science Network and the founder of the International Research Production System, XOX Labs. Marta. 
Marta Jimenez is, who you all must know, is a Portuguese artist with a degree in fine arts from the University of Lisbon and an MST from the University of Oxford. Fancy. Marta is the director of Cultivamos Cultura, the leading institution devoted to the experimental art in Portugal and Ectopia, dedicated to facilitate the collaborative work between artists and scientists. Marta has worked in the intersection of art and biology since the late 90s in the UK, Australia, the Netherlands and Portugal, exploring the conceptual and aesthetic opportunities offered by biological sciences for visual representation in the arts. And then last but not least, Roland van Dierendonk is an Amsterdam based artist. Is an Amsterdam based artist and practice a uh, based researcher, PhD candidate at the Lab for Living uh, Centre in Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. He has a background in biology, media technology and the biological arts, apparently not handwriting. Um, Roland's current research involves um, translating human microbe connections into sensory experiences using haptics and audiovisual chronomicroscopy techniques. Okay, are we done? Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> okay, so just to, um, just to give a little bit of a framing for this panel uh, and the title, the, um, the thematic premise is inspired by the Umberto Eco novel, The Island of the Day Before, um, and we aim to explore what we can learn through revisiting um, these historical approaches and engagements with food ecologies. Um, be they arts historically romanticized engagements with nature and the sublime, all the way through to more recent fetishization such as food porn and social media. Um, using a range of different approaches that explore how these modes of representation and reflections have changed since industrialization, digitization, network protocols and biotechnologies up until now and then looking towards the future. So has anyone read this book, The Island of the Day Before? Good. I, was, I hope some of you did your homework. Um, so, yeah, so basically it's, for me, I mean, I, I'm not going to go through the synopsis of the book. I have it as a PDF if anyone would like it. But um, for me, it's very much, it's, it's a text about how subjective histories can shape our journeys in life and how they can get in a way of objective, pragmatic decisions in regards to solving problems. Um, in particular, it is in relation to this notion of the water and drowning in the sea. Um, is the kind of underlying paradigm of the book, in a sense. Um, and also drowning in your own personal histories, in that sense. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, in terms of this, that's a way, um, for me, in the wider scope of this panel, and also the, the project that's similar, to, that's got the same name as this panel, um, as a way of kind of developing a project that looks at fluvial ecologies, gastronomy, microbio, um, science, etc., and interfacing this with the public um, and trying to kind of overcome these subjectivities. So this discourse builds on precedents such as Homer's The Odyssey, um, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, even Noah's Ark, uh, where this notion of like within one vessel an entirely unique and subjective space can occur with uh, rich narratives that can inspire us for centuries and thousands of years to come. So, as with all islands, there is a factor of isolation and therefore limited communication. And within the case of art science, there is often several limitations on how our work evolves from an idea to a work of art. Uh, but this is also compounded by situating this in the public realm and how the public perceive such works. Um, more so, um, also when you're working outside of traditional gallery spaces and you're working in these more um, hybrid formats of presentation, this can be problematic. Often within ecological discourse, getting back to our field, we think in terms of discrete biotopes, much like we do with art movements and happenings and debates over how discrete ecologies uh, and environments should have a more networked approach. These have been occurring for a long time, actually, um, but more recently with natural phenomena such as mycelium networks becoming um, very, very popular within uh, the realm of bioart, uh, this is becoming more, more prevalent. This discourse therefore links to food supply chains uh, and production processes from seed to farm to table to mouth to stomach to earth, et cetera, et cetera. 
And inherent to this is the notion of nourishment and what it, this entails in terms of not only food, but also information, health, ecologies, and of course, economics, policies, and other social factors. To contextualize this a little bit and, and segue a little bit into the project before um, I move to the next panelist, um, Franz Zaver, who runs, he's the director of Stavakstadt, runs halfbit.org and the Donautiksverein in, in Linz, where I live, often refers to this notion of floating islands of information in his boat-based or nautical artworks that focus on how information is transmitted in the wider uh, context of nature, life, physics, and the universe. Most recently through, as I said, halfbit.org, um, Donaltics, and Stavakstadt, which are all encompassed in the same kind of bubble. So Amin Medosh, who works closely with Franz Xavier until his unfortunate recent death, uh, also discussed this same concept, but expanded on it to this idea of islands of resistance. So when he was talking about this, he's talking kind of about this notion of like pirate radio ships and the potential of them in the context of, of Google and, and big internet network-based media um, as a kind of a, a way of emancipating us in terms of information from these sites. Um, so this also ties into this notion of Island of the Day Before, where we have these kind of discrete kind of like um, <clears throat> bubbles of information. Um, to frame it a little bit more in terms of ecology and Blake Joy's The Aesthetics of Ecology and Impossibility, uh, Matt Fuller and Olga uh, Gorionova argue that critical discourse in ecology, particularly in relation to agriculture, industry, and contemporary society is problematic due to the topic being, and I quote, an expansive one that is both hungrily sensual and abstract. It's about bad things. It discusses conditions such as anguish and devastation, which relate to the ecological, but are also constitutive of politics, the ethical, and the, form in, uh, the formation of subjectivities and beings. These combine in the present day at multiple scales and in many ways, but are also too often avoided, considered finite or absolute, rendered indifferent, yet totalizing because we don't yet have the language to speak about them. And I, I think that the panelists um, here today are very much contributing towards this, this greater universal language of discussing ecology in a way that is, um, again, not scientific or not necessarily in that realm. So, just to kind of finish on a little bit with the, the project idea. So this whole kind of notion of Island of the Day Before came about when COVID first happened. And I was stuck, well, I wasn't stuck. I went and escaped to this boat that's on the town in Linz for six weeks. I had, no I had no internet. And so I started reading books again, which is where I reread Island of the Day Before for the first time since I was 20. And um, a few other books. And so it kind of, from this, I started thinking about this idea of like, um, you know, what happens when you're in isolation? And being isolated, obviously, that's a much easier way to think about what happens when you're in isolation than thinking about it when you're in a room and discussing it with a whole bunch of people. But um, what was really interesting was I started really relating to this main protagonist from the book, uh, Roberta de Agriva. Um, in this notion of revisiting all of my past experiences with a twinge of kind of like helplessness and futility, thinking that the world would end around me. Um, it was a very strange month, but out of it evolved some projects. Um, so just to finish on the project that I'm talking about, I won't talk much about it in this panel, but if you want to know more, there's more information. But basically, it's a new project that I'm, I'm just starting now and I've just got funding for, which is reconnecting with historical agricultural practices and soil profiles that used to exist in urban and industrial reasons on a global scale using modern and scientific technological and cultural methods. It primarily focuses on microbes as a way uh, to communicate ecology and climate action, developing agricultural systems that connect to a global network of similar projects via my teleagricultural platform that I just presented at the institutional presentations. Um, so just to explain this, it started in Linz. This is an area, the current area of, of Linz around the Danube. Most of you probably know the top star where Ars Electronica is. This is the rest of Linz for, for you. Um, what's really interesting was up until, up until Hitler, this is what Linz looked like. It was all agricultural land and it was farmland. And then Hitler came along and wanted to industrialize Linz. Now, what was really interesting was this kind of is modern Linz. And so this has kind of happened where it's very quickly had an urban sprawl and industrial setting. Now, this is very 
un, uh, this is very common, obviously, this happens, occurs a lot around the world. Um, what's really interesting is this subjective perspective of, of the, I would say, of the public inlands, where the perception is we're the steel city, and that's an affectionate name they, they, they give each other, which I find really interesting because it's actually post-industrial revolution that this occurred. It's, it's in the 30s and the 40s. So it's kind of interesting to still define yourself by something that was, one, instigated by Hitler, and two, really unnecessary. Um, anyway, this is just, a, it's an interesting kind of impulse or catalyst to kind of start thinking about how easily it is over a very short period of time, particularly in the context of deep time, to start thinking about um, how quickly things can change from agricultural to urban and industrial, and then, well, from nature to agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. But then also looking at this idea of reversibility and what are the potentialities of reversing things and or countering them, which I think um, the panelists here are gonna talk about more. So this is the current site, so I'm not gonna talk any more about this. This is um, articles, stuff, yeah, cool. Okay, moving on tomorrow. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I, is this working? Can you hear me? Oh, super. Uh, I think enough has been said uh, about me. I just want to say, as Julian said, my background was art history. I'm working as an artist now, and I'm particularly interested in microorganisms and how we deal with them, how we understand them, and how do we relate in a trans-species mode. That's like the most, uh, the, what it's, generating more curiosity in me at the moment. So if you wanna. So I do hold a PhD. And um, can you show the other uh, images? Because for some reason they're not there. One more, one more. Yeah, there you go. So what I want to introduce to you today is a very simple idea. I'm gonna be really brief about it, which is to think about food as a place of convergence of many of the things that we are passionate about. Somehow it becomes an excuse of something that we cannot go around. It's always present. And at the same time, it holds a lot of things that we're interested in and that we're passionate about. So I'm thinking about food, firstly, in terms of community. So the activity of eating together, what does it mean to exchange and eat together? And here on the right uh, side, you can see a Roman representation of food, right? So we have these ancient cultures of food. And I'm also thinking in deep time, but also contemporarily. So I'm thinking here underneath, you have Maya Minder. So she gave an incredible workshop in Femme Meeting in Portugal, where we were producing fermented products and we were like touching everything with our hands and becoming very aware of how the microbes that came from our bodies were gonna become part of the process of the foods that we're gonna eat together. But um, so this is the first thing. How do we build the communities around eating, but also around cooking? And this also brings us to the things that we eat. What do we eat and how have we been eating, right? So there's cultures on the things that we choose to eat. And we, were, we just had uh, recently uh, performance meditation at Mediamatic with Roland. And then we were thinking about chili peppers, which are also an ancient food of Mesoamerica. And we can start also thinking about why do people in this region are, are so passionate about eating chili peppers, right? So how does this become part of our cultures remotely, in the case here in the, in the Florentine Codex, but how also becomes contemporary part of our, uh, our experience, our, our bodily experience and our experiences with food. And finally, the thing I'm most interested about is trans-species relationships. How do we build relationships with the others, with our microbiomes through our choices of food? So again, we have traditional forms of fermentation and processes that we carry out in food. Like here we have an example of 17th century cheeses. And then we have continuity with contemporary works. We have here Christina Agapaki's work, self-made, where she's taking samples from celebrities from the, uh, from the art world and then making cheese out of them. So we wonder why this you know, you like your the cheese smells like feet. It's probably because they are like you know, sharing the same kind of metabolites and of microbes. Coming through this topic, right now I'm doing an artist in residency here in Barcelona at the Institute of Biomedical Research, and I'm working on this idea. The main idea is the is that we are losing microbiodiversity as there is a loss of biodiversity in the world in, at the macro scale, we have the same problem inside of our bodies. And many of you may know that this carries consequences of, to health that are very significant, right? So we can develop allergies, obesity, Alzheimer's. There's a very high risk of losing our biodiversity and that this is what this work is dealing with. I'm making um, 
a series of experiments on my own body by taking out uh, industrialized diets with artificial sweeteners and other highly processed foods that will like destroy my own microbiodiversity and we're measuring that compared to other Mediterranean and hyper uh, microbial diets to see what are the transformations they carry out and in terms of the ecosystems of the micro ecosystems but also in how your body functions and relates to the world so this work rebiosis is about asking is also about the relationship right so in, instead of what if, instead of thinking about aversion and rejection and i don't think it's a problem here but in the outside world if you think about bacteria everyone is like ew you know if would you eat bacteria everyone is like no you know really gonna wash this before i eat because i don't want to eat bacteria and this work is about displacing a little bit from this aversion and disgust into uh, communion, into closeness. And thinking about the most intimate form of relating, which you can see, how, can, how intimate can I be with you? Can I kiss you? Is it sex? But actually, the most intimate connection you can have with someone or with something is to eat it. So it becomes part of yourself. <laughs> and this is what the work is about. Can you? So this is, uh, these, are, these are fundamental questions that I'm asking about these multi-species relationships in eating, how to become the other. Instead of like setting up hierarchical uh, distributions of, of pain, death, and life, we have this biopolitical theme of who gets to live, who gets to suffer, and who gets eaten, and who becomes whom through this process of consumption. So here you can see we were, we're going to be literally, literally eating bacteria and some of these bacteria are isolated from me. So we are also discussing, are these my bacteria because they were inside my body or not? And are we disgusted to eat each other through our microorganisms? So this is, these are some of the questions that I'm thinking. Uh, Roland and Julian have a similar project, also thinking on the microbiome that they've been developing in Buffalo. So that, that was rebiosis. If you, if you want, I would love to speak more about it. And some of the themes for discussion, if you would like to ask questions about it, but especially to the panel that we can think together about, is this idea of ingestion as intimacy, right? How imagining the matter of the otter that integrates into our microbiome and this symbiogenesis, because as you know, the origin of multi-species organisms comes from eating each other, right? So that's how eating each other is a way of becoming. And also in terms of microbiopolitics, as I said before, how do we distribute who dies, who like who, if the plant is gonna die or the animal is gonna die or the microbe is gonna, I'm gonna eat it. So how do we distribute the politics of death and life as we eat and exist? And finally, this idea of fermenting and eating together as social acts, which I think Maya uh, is an expert on in these cultures of food and microbiomes as a form of, of heritage. Yeah, thanks. So now we, we actually move to Eric now. Awesome. Okay. So as a scientist, I do a lot of these open uh, uh, workshops with food and so on. But being on stage with the likes of Maya Minder, I think she can speak better to that sort of practice. What I'm going to uh, focus on um, and offer to the discussion is a bit of history and a bit of absurdity. Anytime, Julian, whenever you're ready. Take, take your time. We've got lots of time. So here we are, 3000 BC. Yeah? So in 7,000 years or more, we've had agriculture, and we see we're just beginning now with city-states leading to kingdoms. Yeah? We can think about city-state, kingdom, empire, in terms of size. Next. <sighs> Julian, come on. You're cramping my style, man. Come on. So now we have 600 BC. Yeah? 2,400 years later, and no, oh, back, back, please. <laughs> so now we have kingdoms, 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 you know, all around. So this, this is this kind of timeline. We can imagine a ramp, right? We can imagine a ramp of speed, kind of, kind of accelerating as technologies get lost and found and lost and found and get built upon. Now we just go back uh, for 100 years, and we have the Achaemenid Empire. Yeah. So we have a scale. We had scales of about a thousand kilometers squared, something like this, and now we have about. 5K, you know, we have like a large country today. So this sort of globalized reach, now Persia is reaching, you know, to the Greeks, to uh, the Hebrews, to the uh, Indians, to the Chinese. And this is, this, is, this is having a scale and an impact that is, that is unprecedented and brings us to a kind of new stage. Yeah? We have an impact on the earth. And, and I want us to think a bit about this as a proxy for modernism. Yeah? Next. So 
there are certain shifts that we found in, in, in scientific ecolog ecological history. We have certain moral shifts, certain attitudinal shifts, and certain shifts in relation to the environment in order to abstract things, in order to scale things, and in order to unify larger and more uh, heterogeneous groups of people. Yeah? So these are some of the shifts. Yeah? You can look at some of these from narrative to analytic, authority to evidence. Next. And the one I want us really to focus on, of course, is the attitude towards food. Yeah. So you can see there's other things, um, and fortunately Morrow did uh, an excellent job of speaking to how this diversity and the loss of it is really tied into this. Yeah. So we have attitudes towards sex, we have attitudes towards uh, human virtues, goals of human life, you know. But the food, we go from this positive relationship, because we need food, you know, and then with an abundance and an affluence, suddenly we go to this ambivalent or even negative attitude. Next. So I'm going to call this negative food cultures. Yeah. So there are two aspects to negative food cultures that I want us to think about. One is the affluence that I've talked about, and the second is a kind of absurdity. Once we have a negative relationship to food, what are we talking about, right? We sort of ontologize food in this bizarre way. It's still there, obviously. We still need it, and yet the relationship has suddenly been complexified and become absurd, right? Food as a sort of optional entity that becomes new with this sort of, with, 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 with getting this much energy from the earth and being able to scale up our technology to this level. There are three things I want us to think about with this. One is that the abundance is greater than, than, than it has been, right? So there's more energy being taken from the earth. Um, the other thing is that the nutrition has gone down. So there's a protein carb shift, there's monocultures become a thing, right? Obviously, a lot of these things are predating, but this reaches a level where it becomes systemic, we can say, yeah? And the second is new foods. You have globalized foods, and you have all kinds of additives. Things like spices and such aren't nutritive, and yet they're things that are adding flavors or things that we, we become accustomed to, we adapt to, um, and they're not local, and, and they're, they're increasing a, a sort of somatic load. They're increasing the sort of enjoyment, perhaps, and that it's also so, uh, sort of pushing our, our ability to adapt. So, thanks. Um, and I'm going to call this also the superorganism meets its mismatch. Once again, Maro, I think, did a really good job of, of talking about what's a superorganism. We are our environment, right? We, each one of us, need like an environment that's about this theater or maybe double or triple or you know, quadruple. We come with all that, you know? Without that, we just, we just aren't, right? Um, and these are some ideas there. There's some literature that you start to see that has an abstraction that we've never seen before. We start having good and bad in the Zenda Vesta, right? We start having these sort of like uh, agape ideals. We start having a kind of Buddhist selflessness. We start having, um, you know, these, these abstracted notions. And then within the Jewish communities, we have this literature that's almost an activist literature, you know, literate exiles. This is a combination that we haven't seen until now, right? This is the kind of abundance, how it's spread. Um, and I'm going to call this the edible revolution, and we can ask ourselves how to fast your way into moral abstraction. And now we're getting into the absurdity. So these are some projects that I've done along these lines, thinking about this bizarre relationship of food. Uh, this was a literary movement that I did um, that ultimately manifests as, as a food network effect. Essentially, it was con contentless. There were so many movements going on, and I decided to create a movement with almost no content. And then all my, a bunch of artist friends kind of took this up and started to do all these variations, and this is one example of that. And so it kind of illustrates tangibly what that mimetic network is. This is uh, logical fetishism. So I worked in the Pathology Museum in Vancouver. I harvested a bunch of these images, and I started to create these interactive things that essentially did nothing. Yeah? So, taking the logic to this comestible material realm and, and, it, and it gains this kind of impenetrance and absurdity. Next. And finally, um, the Digestive Control Society, uh, which is my reply to Deleuze, um, uh, which entails resistance via indigestion, uh, which I showed at the Tate. And this is basically a vegetable interface, human vegetable interaction, HVI. And uh, through the HVI, you interact with the, uh, this sort of uh, bizarro, glitchy, organic environment. Next. Um, and then these are other projects that relate to this, controlling the internet with food, uh, protein companion construction kit, when you're working so long that you need to build friends in the lab because you become so lonely from doing these projects. Um, and then the kitchen as foundational laboratory, which again is this sort of like the, uh, the community thing that we're really going to talk about. Um, and then these are the things I want to take home, that we have the empire of negative food and irritated bowels, um, and we can think about uh, indigestive rebellion, exiles, literate in the cookbook literature, uh, the domesticated comics of biological control, and then things like genetic surveillance, dumb medical abstraction, biopolitics for those who skip breakfast. Thank you, Eric.
So, my, so <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, um, I'm going to talk a bit about fermentation because this is my practice, which um, I learned in art school, not really. But uh, I started to combine uh, the bio biographical references that I had, I had from my Korean mother and started to ferment on a DIY basis. And I realized very suddenly, because my curiosity also driven me to read lots of articles on the topic of microbiome, because the internet is open and you can just search for them. And I started to realize that the behind fermentation, there's so much uh, entangled because it's materialistic, it's emotional, it implies body, it's, it's really learning by doing and especially making these invisible actors um, visible and tangible as well. And so since then I started to teach like uh, fermentation to the people because I realized that um, there really is a need, like we've been, we lost fermentation practices since 60 years because of our civilization, the in, in, invention of fridges, industrialization, and I guess what struck me the most was that fermentation practices is as old as civilization. It might even have been the reason that humans civilized the the sweet secrets to brew your own beer, this magical drink as well. And so I thought of like, if science now 200 years old has now come up with all those instruments, like how did we ferment it before? And that's why the things that we have incorporated in our body, so all our senses are actually the tools that we are, we are sufficient to, to to create this measure of what is good fermentation and what not. Like quite often people ask me in the classes, oh, it's dangerous, oh, I get threatened, oh, can it kill me as well? So I really realized that this fear of bacterial, bacteria and microorganism is huge and we really lost the connectivity to, to this, um, this um, very grounded being of farming, which is connected to farming, which is connected to cooking, recipes and ancient knowledge. You somehow can say that recipes are something that is um, developed by a reason as well. Something tastes good because it has been experimented and uh, probed for hundreds of years. That's why they exist as recipes. And they somehow, they, they, they overcome like a deep time thinking as well. And what was the most striking thing is that um, within my practice, I realized there are so many other people as me who call themselves fermentistas as well, who kind of carry this message to, to, to tell the people about how fermentation is working. And, and I really feel that it's much more than just a trend, which become a global trend with kombucha and kefir. It really is something that is somehow gaining back um, its presence in our human existence as well. So my practice was all about cooking and I made those uh, non-human agents as a main actor of, of, of the installation as well. I said like the table, the table with all its uh, indigested um, commodities and in constant transformation is, is somehow putting them in the center and not the humans as well because within these microbes that we realize they are the origin of life on planet earth and they existed much longer they maybe some also have something to teach us and on the other side we are now in 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 a time of biotechnical revolution like we have crispr we talk about the code of life we say that we have patterns to reshape uh, planet Earth in a geochemical and, and higher impacted way as well. And there I see, I see this difference between nature and culture. So to teach the people also that between breeding and biotechnology, I mean, there is a significant difference that we're starting to, to really scribe and go into DNA, but Looking at the labs itself, the difference is not so big. So teaching the people also about biotechnology is the urge that I think is, is present because the technologies are applied already. And if, if it's not debated in a society and also 
um, debated on a basic democratic way, there might be some bigger mistakes that will be done. So within this fermentation practice, I also made alleys with the so-called kombucha, which is also this biofilm or bacterial cellulose. And kombucha I love so much because I realized kombucha is very much accessible. Like people know about kombucha, they drink their own drink. And if you start to do it at home, you end up with all those um, tea mushrooms, accidentally called tea mushroom because they are a symbiosis between microbes and yeast, fungi. So they somehow they embody this, um, this higher um, um, symbiotic organism or kind of a multi multi-species community that is acting on, on a, for us, invisible way and, and they act more in a swarm-like way that they create new, new materials as well. The fascinating thing about this is it's something which doesn't apply as energy. It's only based on tea and sugar. So it really carries a lot of hope for um, overcoming like um, new technology to replace plastic, or in this case, it's leather as well. And there I thought like, because kombucha is so accessible, like people really have uh, easy access into, into biomedical uh, applications as well in a, in a very simple and breakdown way. So <clears throat> fermentation, as I said, is something which is really globally happening. And there are exhibitions and authors and journalists writing on the topic all around the globe. And there are initiatives where through food, through the vehicle of food, we transport all this knowledge that somehow is, has been lost but at the same time is also connecting to, to a very high sphere of, of scientific um, um, perception as well. And here just to see that, um, again, this piece was inspired by, again, looking at what nature and culture itself is. So here I was inspired by, um, by the, the tree trimmers of Versailles Gardens and also it's, it's a small garden movement in the suburbs of, of Paris where they try to trim the, the fruit trees onto walls to create this kind of pattern as well. And pattern is something which is reoccurring in fermentation all the time again. It's not about efficiency, it takes time and it's more about the rhythm that is mostly important. So within this practice of, um, yes, so we can skip this, we can skip this, we can skip. So talking about um, fermentation and those agents, I encountered also Lynn Margulis, of course, who also is talking about um, the cyanobacteria and the protist kingdom. And this I think is interesting that this microphobia is somehow its origin is also coming because within the history of science and evolution, there has been the microbes which have always been neglected or denunciated as something which is um, causing disease. So, I mean, Louis Pasteur was the discoverer of, of the lactobacillus and the microbial world. And he somehow, he, he brought this notion about disease into the microbes. And within Lynn Margulis' approach, she sees that the five kingdoms, they are all originating from this microbial world. So as well, she was um, together with uh, James Lovelock talking about the Gaia hypothesis, talking about Earth as an entropic system. And this, this journey is something where I thought that Lynn Margulis should have won a Nobel Prize, but she somehow, she somehow sees um, our perception of the world in a, in a different way where she decentralizes human and puts again the, those ancient um, species into the focus of, 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 of concentration again and talking about this connectivity and correlation that us humans have as well with the, with the microbes. And just to show you maybe a last video, combining food. Thank you. 
inside your mouth with your tongue, so outside your mouth. Feel free to express your compassion or make compassion. We let it sit and climb up. It was a big existential crisis, and the oldest of homophotosyntheticals mm -hmm. did not know what to do. Full of diversity, too much performing images of individuality. So just giving a bit of context there, I mean, this homo photosyntheticus is like this em embarking into this thesis and speculating what if humans are able to change through their microbiome in a more plant-based green human as well. And um, as you saw, it's, it's, it's always collaboratively because I think sometimes the big ideas, they exist in many parts, so they race and they come to to a center and the, the topic of the cyanobacteria, the algae and food and digestion brings it all together and, and talks about uh, human evolution in, in a new way and speculates about it, yes. Okay, thanks, Mahaya. Okay, um, on to Marta. You can play the video, video first, yes. So I'm not here as a... Well, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm here as an artist um, and part of this community as well, but um, I'm here to present uh, my, my identity as a host, I would say. So, my strategies as a host. Uh, this is a video that we did for our garden at Earth Electronica in 2020. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about our strategies at Cultivamos Cultura, um, motivated, well, by my desire to, to uh, welcome people into my corner of the world, uh, into my home. Uh, uh, so I'm from the south of Portugal. And uh, like everybody else, we have uh, a lot of traditions. We have uh, an amazing landscape. And, uh, and uh, I'm from a place that is now, and has been for a, a little while, been described as a, or been named as a natural park, which is a sort of an interesting um, uh, and, and uh, debatable uh, idea in itself. Um, so uh, when I started uh, designing a workshop or uh, an experience for people to come to our space and, and try to understand a little bit more or experience what it is to uh, look at life happening and and to work with life as a as a, a, a concept as a as a material as a, as an experience to make art um, it became very important to understand what it is to host people in a situation that is very very specific it's very uh, uh, local there's a long culture of food of course because everybody <laughs> and everywhere has a long culture or a long history of food but also it's about understanding what is around you. And, and so in Cultivamos Cultura, our summer school is about a series of experiences. Some that look a little bit more scientific, some that look less scientific, um, uh, some that look more like cooking, even though they're very scientific in their basis, and some that look a lot like science, but they're actually cooking strategies. So um, it's, it's, it's about, um, yeah, I, there's very little more that I can say except that it is about 
creating experiences that will allow you to engage with other organisms around you, with the environment, with your uh, situated, uh, and, and situate a little bit of your knowledge that you bring with you, with the knowledge that comes from the locality, and, uh, and understand how that can transform you as well. So I think um, it's very difficult to explain what it is to come to Cultivamos Cultura for those of you who have, you probably have a similar uh, uh, challenge and okay, so what was your experience in that part of the world? Uh, and it's, for me, it's, it's really hard to explain what it is to be in a, in a place like Cultivamos Cultura, in a village like San Luis, in a county like Odmira and in a country like Portugal. So the only thing that I can, I can say is please come and experience it for yourself and experience it with the people that you will find that at there at that specific moment because that will also make it into a different experience. Um, I am now preparing for our next summer school which will start at the beginning of July and we have a summer school every July. And you can stay for a week or you can extend uh, your stay uh, uh, a couple more weeks or more. And it's, 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 um, it's about um, engaging what, what is there. And there's a, a particular feeling in the house. It's a very old house. It's a house of uh, uh, my husband's family. It was the agriculture center of the family. And so the whole, the walls have a life. The walls have a, a feeling and you see ghosts or you feel them or you whatever. Uh, the house reacts to you sometimes. It's sort of, uh, yeah, you know, shelves come down for no reason whatsoever um, and you, you know, <laughs> it's sometimes it's uh, intimidating but I think most of the time it is welcoming and it is a very particular space we have uh, the river we have the ocean uh, we go to the beach um, we engage <laughs> with the with the with the ecosystem and the and the environment very very much and uh, every year we have a group of people that come. Uh, some are artists who are in residence, some are artists who come to do workshops with us. Uh, we also have the local artists who come and, and, and do things with us as well. So there's a very lively uh, uh, and active uh, um, community in the village of artists uh, who have moved to San Luis and they come from all over the world. And, um, and it, you're sort of in the countryside, but in uh, a, very, uh, a very present uh, human community as well. And they come and see what we do, which is very, very nice. Um, um, so it's, it's quite an experience. So after the video, uh, so like I said, we have some activities that very, very, very much uh, science uh, or uh, 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 science-based. We have, uh, for every summer school, we have a scientist in the house who's actually the owner of the house, my husband, Luis Grasa, who's an immunologist, and you don't get to be in Cultivamos Cultura House without getting a lecture on your immune system. Um, but it's sort of interesting and fun to understand a little bit more of the immune system and maybe see it as you've never seen it before, because we have, we all have ideas of what the immune system is, and most of them have to do with fighting and, and, and preventing disease and all of that, and actually talking to an immunologist may change your perspective on that, please. Like I said, we go to the ocean, we go to the beach, and, and we do a very basic, uh, uh, this is something that we do every time, we do a very basic in vitro fertilization of sea urchins, um, and it's, it's incredibly moving, not just to go to the habitat of these organisms and pick them up and try to be as careful with them as we can. So we don't uh, harm them, so we don't disturb them too much. We take them for a day and then we bring them back. And we sort of co-parent a lot of new sea urchins with these uh, organs, organisms and uh, we release the offspring back into uh, the wild as well. Sorry, not yet. <laughs> And it is, it is like you saw in the video, you saw the first cell divisions of a new organism and it is incredibly moving to do so. Now you can turn, sorry. Um, we talk about ecosystems and we talk about 
uh, new senses that we can try and develop to listen or to sense these ecosystems and these other organisms. And uh, uh, um, here we have an example of Nigel Kellier's uh, hydrophone workshop that he did with us. And uh, so we took these hydrophones to the ocean and we tried to listen to um, what is there. And of course, microbiology, how can we escape this, this microbiology is us and we are microbiology and it's all around us. And sometimes it's about looking very closely, but also just looking from afar. I'm finishing, yes? <laughs> um, and so there's, of course, food. And sometimes food looks like blood uh, and, and, and viscera. Uh, sometimes it looks like a, a, a romantic painting, a very Baroque way, and we use it and we then consume it. And sometimes, of course, there's fermentation, there's making bread together, and there's making cheese. And all of these activities, sort of uh, sitting down at the table and eating what we've done or eating how we've done is, uh, is part of the, the glue of, of Cultivamos Cultura and Summer School. Thanks, Milo. Okay, so we're going to quickly move on to Roland because we have about, well, around five minutes left. So I'll just go straight to you, Roland. Okay, the second slide for a bit. No, previous, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm the last one. I, I, I'm Roland van Diegedong. Um, I'll try to keep you on your toes because you, I'm the last, so you probably need some um, engagement here, you know. And they asked me to be very critical um, of... Uh, myself or of like bio art. So uh, my talk here is called Fermentation, a less biohazardous way to make bio art at home. Um, and I'm, uh, and I'm, <laughs> I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Sheffield Hellem University where my, um, uh, 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 it's called Sensing Microbes. Anyway, this is other project which I don't talk about, but you can see on my website called Chrono Microscopy. Go to the next one. Um, right, so previously I've, um, done a lot of facilitating uh, using uh, scientifically looking methods uh, to like a general audience of artists and designers and um, within for example the biohack academy which is a program at Waag which I've led uh, for two years where it was during 10 weeks people learned to make their own laboratory equipment and also learn how to do their own um, laboratory uh, experiments and make their own art project with bio art. Um, and I've also been involved in projects like Mold Rush with this picture by Raphael Kim, uh, which creates like a biotic game using molds growing on black agar where people play over three days, a very slow growing game. So these both use like a scientific reductionist approach, which is very suited for, suited for monocultures, meaning if you want to grow your E. coli, you have to work very sterilely. You have to learn how to work with a flame or how to work in a hood. And um, so I was thinking this, this kind of laboratory tool which we always use like this petri dish art right like agar art is not really um, suited for this networked understanding of microbial networks and ecology because that requires like a tool which is much less focused on the monoculture um, right and oh yeah and so if you have petri dish and agar art outside of this controlled uh, environment it leads to a, a, a caution biohazard which is the symbol in the right bottom uh, and this means that you can create kind of a a biosafety risk for yourself or others. I mean, there might grow a mold on this mold rush that infects you. And even Raphael Kim, who was the moderator of uh, Mold Rush, wrote in the, one of the articles that, that, that we wrote about it that the, that the moderator, which was him, he was the moderator, but like of the game, got like hallucinations on day three. Um, so it's a risk to play with Petri dish art. Um, so as an alternative to this, because I'm not only critical, as the alter alternative to this, I was thinking fermentation is a less biohazardous way to make bio art at home. Uh, I've developed this uh, idea um, uh, during a podcast for the Blue City Lab last year, um, where I also used the term domestic science, which is by Eric Zepka, um, who just mentioned this as well. I mean, Eric, you did like the kitchen as foundation, foundational laboratory in 2019, I think. I think there you developed the term domestic science, but I really like it. This hands-on approach of like fermentation of things you can do in like a kitchen environment, opposed to like opposed to like the opposed to like the laboratory tools which you need an actual lab for, and which people try to copy in the kitchen, which might be a biohazard. Um, and uh, 
I've worked with, Ju with fermentation myself a lot too, with Julian, who is like a master uh, chef and fermenter. Lastly, we did the Riverbank uh, Buffet zine and then the few year fermented biome in Coalesce in Buffalo, where we just returned to from, in a way. But we did the residency where we ate four different fermented weeks, uh, four different fermented foods each week, and then uh, tested our own microbiome to see if we become more the same and if this kimchi, or if these lactobacteria from the kimchi and this Vasilis subtilis from the natto and stuff live on in us, and we're still waiting on the result. Um, what? They came in. Yeah, we got the result. I didn't see this. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. So um, my practice has also focused both on making food and tasting food, um, uh, pff, uh, because I think both, as we have seen in the previous talks, are very valuable as kind of way of engaging the public with food. So making food, for example, with Hege Tapia, I don't know if she's here, but she's, she's around somewhere. Uh, yeah, she's at ICA, but if she's here, here. Um, I, I gave a workshop for uh, the Scandinavians, there's also uh, Scandinavians in the hall too, um, for the Norwegian bio art arena where we made natto, which is are these spores from Bacillus subtilis, where you ferment these soybeans and clay, this slimy, very nice, very, well, actually almost nobody liked it in our workshop, but I really, I really started to like natto. Um, um, it was also fun to send this to 12 people around Scandinavia and not, and not being stopped by the DHL. But the thing is making together is very valuable uh, and also having the time to kind of take the time to put your feet in the soil and experience something weird outside of your normal comfort zone, as you see in this picture. If you have any Zoom meeting, I would really advise you to let everybody get dirt and put their feet in the soil. This was, this was very fun. Um, and then also my practice focus on now on tasting food. And I really like this idea of kind of how can you not only ferment food, but also uh, let people experience uh, food in a different way and be aware of their own taste sensations. So with Maro, I did the chili pepper pleasure last week, which was a guided meditation on pain and pleasure. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, some panel interests and themes. Uh, I don't want to talk about this actually because I wrote much better ones here. Um, so don't look at the screen, just look at my focal point as Marta called it, <laughs> which is my, <laughs> uh, which is my uh, gap in my thing. So I have like two that I want to share, okay? Okay, which were kind of there, but then here they are better. So the first one is I was thinking. So it's called Islets of the Day Before, which is this vessel for subjectivity. Uh, and, and you, Julian talked about it, this discrete bubbles of information that we all are. But I was thinking, islands of the day before, no, we are more like a fungal network of like exchanges, right? So I was thinking, instead of islands of the day before, maybe we got it like fungi networks of the future. He's rewriting our talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. That was the first point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The second, second point is better, though. Second point is better. So um, I was thinking a lot about, like, I'm Dutch, right? I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch. And um, also through... I don't know if you know a lot about Dutch culture, but they're very like functional people and very like, functional. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It was a joke, right? Yeah, I'm gonna I mean, yeah, I mean, engineers as well. I mean, <laughs> the country wouldn't would be underwater, uh, underwater if not for the dikes. And I mean, like the water, the water municipalities were the start of like democracy in the, in the Netherlands in the middle Middle Ages. But um, this also means that we see food as something that's very optional. So it's very very Dutch to see like food as something engineered and like functional intake. And we kind of lost the idea of food as pleasure, but also have no idea where it comes from. And often it comes from a factory. So I was really interested in kind of bringing back this kind of tangible relationship to where food comes from and, and where it's going in your body. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Roland. I think we know that. Right? Clap. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we're, we're over time, actually. I planned for a 20-minute discussion. I fucked that up, didn't I? Um, we can have minus three questions. So, um, yeah, basically, so, so to end Anyone on... Anyone has I, a negative question going back in time? Yeah, obviously, uh, if you guys want to speak to anyone, um, everyone's here for the, the rest of the, the conference, of course. Um, I think, obviously, it's, it's a very important topic, not just to all of us, but to everyone. And these notions of attitudes towards food and also, like, micro... Um, I like this notion of microbiopolitical bias through fermentation. So I might end on that as a notion um, to sort of stew on and ferment on. But of course, we, we have to go for the future of ASEA panel that's coming up soon. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists for coming and for the time. Um, really interesting topics. And yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thanks. And most of all, you.